keynote speaker at the Ohio, the Libertarian Party of Ohio's uh, convention, I think four years ago, 2012. And uh, he was the only guy in the room who had crazier hair than I did. So I was like, this guy's gonna be cool. Um, and you've probably seen him on CBS's Survivor. Um, again, he's got a great foundation called uh, Rupert's Kids that he keeps uh, going here in Indiana. And uh, he also ran against Mike Pence. Woo! Woo! Uh, do Mike Pence but say yeah for this guy. Um, I should have been clear about that. All right. Uh, he has a great picture of him shaking Mike Pence's hand and then him looking at the camera and just like, I do not want to be touching this guy. Uh, so Indiana would have been way better if he had been elected governor four years ago, but uh, we're so glad that he could be here tonight. Please keep it going for Rupert Bonham, everybody. Well, yes, I did run for governor. Um, if I would have known what I was doing, I, no, I would have still done it. I just would have went into it with a little more open eyes. Um, it's amazing what happens in our world when we start looking at what's going on. I never really was political. I was more that advocate for change. I started my mentoring program in 91. When we started taking the vocational ed out of our high schools, when we started throwing our children away, when we started having our own leaders saying there's a segment of the population we don't care about. That's when we started our program. If you look at it, our own government looks at the bottom 20%, the poorest of us, the, the ones, the uneducated, as the ones to fill our detention centers. Mm -hmm. They set laws in front of us knowing they were going to fill our detention centers. When I ran for governor in 2012, I had a contract from Pendleton facility to a private sector industry guaranteeing we would stay above 95% capacity for the next 10 years, guaranteeing. And if we didn't, we would pay to offset the loss of revenue for food service in an institution when we're turning people, our peers, our neighbors, our children, our parents into a commodity. When we look at somebody hurting themselves booze, pot, truancy, boredom, lost, um, and we start throwing them in jail. Let's take pot. We've been smoking pot since we've been in the United States. We've got letters from George Washington talking about his crops. They're out there. It's not talking about anything but pot. <laughs> and he brags about it. Our Constitution was written on hemp paper. When we were taking land away from the Native Americans and giving it to us, we promised to grow four crops, corn, soybeans, wheat, and hemp. For years, Indiana was one of the largest producers of hemp in the world, Indiana. We still got it growing wild in Indiana, and our cops know about it, and they watch it, and they arrest the kids for picking it. It gives you a headache, don't smoke it. <laughs> it's rope dope, it's ditch weed, but it's also a great money-making crop. The United States spends $200 billion a year. This was about $200 billion a year bringing hemp products into the United States. Um, why aren't we growing it here? Hemp creates 100 gallons per acre per harvest for ethanol. In World War II, every diesel engine was converted over to, to running hemp ethanol. You never, you'll start seeing about it now. 65 years later, they're starting to release that information. All our soldiers were clothed in hemp clothing. All our documents written on hemp paper. Oil, timber, and cotton came in after World War II and said, if you release this, it will bankrupt us. It will destroy our economy. The government kept it quiet. Cotton, oil, and timber. Uh, I don't want to disparage anybody, but I tell you, there are a lot better products to use, a lot better industries that we could be doing. What farmer wouldn't want three harvests a year? What factory wouldn't be thrilled to create the, the hemp concrete factory, the, the textile factory, the ethanol factory that we've got in every community across Indiana. We've got empty factories. We've got the physicians. We've got the people. 
um, hundreds of billions of dollars. That's just hell. But let's talk about the detention center and the number five generator in our gross domestic product, but it doesn't create any products other than pain. It creates career criminals. We take a 16, 18 year old kid that's smoking pot and throw him in a, in a jail cell full of a bunch of other grown men or women that have a whole different idea on what you should be doing and how you should be making money. And I'll grab a hold of you as one of those people in prison and be fed workers all day long. We've created a system where we're trying to tell ourselves we're keeping ourselves safe, safe by locking up all these people that are breaking the law. Well, I'm sorry, we've had mayors, governors, and presidents that have admitted, I mean, even Mitch admitted to keeping a shoebox full of pot in his dorm room. He was our governor. He's now running Purdue. Obama's admitted to way more than that. We know Bush loves the, the nose candy. <laughs> she talked about it. Um, and they were our leaders. We put our kids in jail for way less than that. And 40% of our people in jail are in there because of hurting themselves, mostly pot, 40%. But it's 30, 40, 50, 60, Marion County, $80,000 a year to keep someone locked up. We're not teaching them how to make a better life for themselves. We're not rehabilitating it. We're teaching them how to be a better criminal. The only thing that that gets us is the ability to spend it again next year. You've got the Democrats and the Republicans both talking about you know, uh, keeping us safe and locking people up and doing all kinds of crazy things. And then we've got the libertarians over there on the other side that are saying, you know, I think I'm strong enough to rule myself. I don't have to be told I can't have the 32 ounce go, I can't have the winner. I can. I'm strong enough to take care of myself. And if I want to hurt myself with a drink or a joint. It should be my choice. Just like if I want to kiss a boy, I marry a boy, it should be my choice. If I want to whatever. I don't want the government in my body. I don't want them in my bedroom. I don't want them in my bathroom. I don't want them in my pocket. I don't want them. There is a time and a place for everything. The government is set up to set the basic standards for us to live by. Not to decide the winners and losers in our world, but the basic standards. And then leave and go back to your job, not be a career politician, and suck off of us. You know, we're looking at so many choices right now. I heard it when I ran for governor in 2012. I'd love to vote for you, but I don't want to waste my vote. And I'd look at them and say, you know, you got John Gregg and Mike Pence and me. The three of us, who do you really believe is for you? A wasted vote is a vote for somebody that doesn't give a darn about you. That's a wasted vote. A wasted vote is somebody, oh, I, they're the lesser of two evils. But I'm standing right there and saying I will fight for all of us. The libertarians want to release information and show what's going on downsize our government, not always be building it. Talking about cutting, not from the program, but from the administration of our government, and taking the programs and creating empowerment programs, not entitlements. An entitlement program, I've watched and fought against it. I am that advocate for change and for social acceptance of all. But we have to have a transition period after 50 years of this war on crime, war on poverty, war on drugs, war on us, that we've created so many entitlement programs that teach you to hold your hand out, sit and be quiet, do what we say and take the money. Don't make too much for yourself or we'll take your money away. Don't do too much for yourself or we'll take your money away. I've got men and women in my program that are living on seven, $800 a month that 
I am trying to slowly wean them off of that as I get them working. But they're all terrified if they make too much money, they lose the benefits. And in that transition period, one of my young men that has uh, epilepsy, and I can't even put him up on a ladder. I've watched him go into epileptic fits. I don't know exactly what we're going to do with him. He's $781 a month on disability. If he makes more than $100 a week, he loses $781 a month. There's got to be some kind of give and take. We, you guys, the younger generation, are the ones that are really going to be able to fix this. We, the baby boomers, set up a great situation for ourselves and didn't think about the future. We didn't. We didn't. Now we're there. Um, I'm the youngest. I'm the tail end of the baby boomers, and it's not even going to last for me. Social Security will be gone. Um, Medicare, Medicaid, who knows when it'll be in another 15, 20 years when I'm finally ready for it. Maybe not that long, gosh, 52. Um, but honestly, what you guys have in front of you is that ability to change the system. Look how we can stand up and take care of ourselves, how we can say no to more governmental growth. And we can say no to more administrative rule over us and say, this is what we want. Create the empowerment programs that teach you how to take care of yourself. I've got many different groups going on right now. It works. When you take someone that's never worked a day in their life, you teach them how to make a legal living. They, in turn, show their children. This summer, we had a five-year-old and an eight-year-old with their dads, each individual dad, working out in the, the community. We now got the phones on us, so I got the GPS tracking so I could stick a phone in a five-year-old's pocket and realize this kid walked four miles. They did five miles. They picked up birds, they cleaned up, and they worked, and they were thrilled at the end of the day. That's a young person that starts seeing value in work. That's somebody that, even though their parents are on the entitlement programs, their kids will not be. It's you guys' unfortunate job to fix what we set up. And we're not going to do it with the platforms that I'm seeing from the Democrats and the Republicans. We're not. I stood up as a libertarian and ran as a libertarian governor because I wasn't a libertarian did not realize it. I've always voted for person, not party. No party, even the Libertarian Party can't get every candidate right all the time. Vote the person. Vote your conscience. Vote who believes in you. I know who I'm voting for. There's only one of three of them that even care about all of us. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about me, check out RupertKids.org. I'm, I'm going to run away because I could stand here and talk forever and ever. But please, keep an eye on what's going on. Keep an eye on the entitlements, and let's turn them upside down and create empowerment programs. Keep an eye on the detention centers. As we're creating more laws, putting us in jail for stuff that the people setting the laws have done, let's stand up and say no. Let's get a Congress, let's get a House and a Senate that's ready to review all the old stuff before we pass anything new. Let's do some cleanup first. And we need your help. Thank you guys very, very much.